Welcome to the Star Wars News Net channel. We are so excited for today's episode because we are approaching the 10 year anniversary. October 3rd is the 10 year anniversary of Star Wars Rebels, and that's just a few days away. So we are going to do just a mega pod today, a mega show where we are going to go through this entire show of Rebels, talk about our favorite moments in Rebels. What were the story arcs that mean the most to us as fans? What about this show do we feel like has stood the test of the last 10 years? And what parts of this show maybe, you know, haven't aged so well or we didn't exactly love at first? I know that Rebels for me is an absolutely critical part of my Star Wars, you know, love. And Luke, I know that it is deeply, deeply meaningful to you as probably one, maybe your favorite Star Wars show. So I, we're going to be talking about that a lot. But real quick, uh, if you have not hit that likes and subscribe button for us, make sure you do that. Please, please, please leave us a quick little uh, comment on what you feel like Star Wars Rebels means to you. We'd love that if you're listening on Apple and Spotify at Star Wars Newsnet you know, give us a little five-star review, write down something you enjoy about Star Wars Rebels and the show. We would love to, to know about that because, you know, Star Wars is so important to Luke and I. We live and breathe for Star Wars and we want to bring you guys three, you know, podcasts or just recordings a week on, you know, our favorite thing, which is Star Wars. And so the only way we can do that is if you hit that like, subscribe button, Drop those podcasts in. Make sure you check out the Timeline show from this last Saturday. Uh, Luke and I uh, broke down. It's the second to last podcast we will have on the Timeline show about Young Jedi Adventures. So make sure you check that out. We're almost done with that portion and 232 BBY. And then this coming Thursday, uh, make sure you tune in to Star Wars Newsnet Live at 10 o'clock Eastern Time. Luke, are you ready to talk about Star Wars Rebels? I'm very ready and I'm very excited. This uh no stretch of the imagination, no no exaggeration. This is my favorite Star Wars television show. Mm -hmm. Live action animated, don't care. It's my favorite one. Mm -hmm. Beats everything else. If you had to have Star Wars Rebels or the prequel trilogy, which would you pick? <laughs> oh, oh no. How I want, um, I want to gauge how much you like how where does this rank for you cuz like putting it above all the shows is a big, that's like a big thing. Just putting it above every show, like Clone Wars, Mando, like whatever. I want to see like, where does this rank in like in movies? Um, I think. Cause that, it is, and that's an impossible question. I'm I just think, messing with you mostly. I'll answer it this way. I think I'd put it above the Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones. I think it maybe just falls a little bit behind Revenge of the Sith. No, I'm saying you either get the prequel trilogy or you get Star Wars Rebels. Which one? Which one? Are All you right. Doing? All right. You want to do this? Okay. Rebels. <laughs> <laughs> you get the sequel trilogy or Star Wars Rebels. Which one are you doing? I'm keeping sequel trilogy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just messing with you mostly. But All right. So let's talk about this. I just want to know real quick. What does, and this is like a loaded question. So keep it as brief as you can. We're going to be getting into this. What does Rebels, you are the biggest Rebels fan I know. What does Rebels mean to you as a Star Wars fan? Um, as a Star Wars fan, I think it shows us that the Jedi were flawed. They fell to the Empire. And it it was a systematic issue. I think it shows me that Jedi can love they can have like Kanan has a wife essentially he has a girlfriend he has a love interest mm -hmm. it does not corrupt him or push him anywhere close to the dark side i think it shows me that just from a jedi perspective there is a lot more that you can do with your life you don't have to be a stoic you don't have to be so dogmatic um i think it really opens up the possibility for what life could be in star wars um it's a really good story of found family um and realizing your true potential so there's a lot of overarching themes that are very good that i think rebels does really well executing mm -hmm. so that's what it means for me i i was curious how you would answer that because your favorite star wars character outside of luke skywalker 
is, according to what you told me before, <laughs> yeah, is yeah, before, is Kane and Jarrett. So I figured you would answer that from a Kane perspective. So I think it's interesting you answered that as like a Kane fan, like talking mostly about the Jedi. <laughs> how yeah. they feel. I mean, I think that's just curious because like when I watch Star Wars Rebels, like I don't, I love Kanan and I love, you know, Ezra to some extent, but I, I really connect more with like the Hera side of things and I love Sabine's Perfect. story. And yeah. so like when I, when I think of, you know, Rebels, I think more about like that feeling of like hope that persists, you know, when Hera talks about, and we'll talk about this, like, we have hope, hope that things will get better and they will. And I think that like that just pure, this is like a pure rebellion story in like the kind of like the positive parts of the rebellion. We don't like Andor kind of gives us the, the nitty gritty of what a rebellion probably actually looks like against the empire. But here we see more of this like purely like hopeful, optimistic morality sense of the rebellion as well. And then I love looking through Sabine's arc and learning more about her backstory and the complication of family and found family and legacy and heritage and what that means as you're navigating like your own path forward. And so that's kind of what where I gravitate towards too in Rebel. So I think we have a nice blend, a nice combo here to, yeah. to get into as, as we dive in. So what we're going to do, we're going to go, I have like just some bullet points of some of the like high points of the different seasons. And we're just going to go through, talk about some of those moments. Did they work for us? Did they not? Uh, let's just have some fun talking about Star Wars Rebels, remembering Star Wars Rebels, which I feel like over time is become more and more popular. Like I think that it, it, a lot of people maybe were, it was hard to gravitate towards the animation style, the way the lightsabers look, some of the storyline, like I know people were probably maybe a little annoyed by Ezra at first, even to some degree, or there's just all these new characters they're having to learn. Uh, but I think over time it's become more and more popular and people have appreciated the the lore that kind of Rebels dives into. So I think this is going to be fun. Are you ready to do this, sir? Oh, absolutely. I am very excited to do this. So season one has the brilliant start off with like this whole voiceover and this moment of the, the empire and all of that. And we meet the grand inquisitor and Lord Vader is there. What did you just seeing that? Like there's the first shots is yeah, Vader, you're meeting the inquisitors for the first time here. What, what did we, what did you think as a star Wars fan? Like I thought that was, I was like, Oh boy, we're, we're in the middle of this now. Yeah. Um, the way that it starts with Vader's, voiceover and the, the introduction kind of the the villains of this show um was awesome because you immediately set the precedent that like we're not starting small really like we're going to start kind of bigger like the villains mm -hmm. are lightsaber wielding force using bad mm -hmm. guys they're inquisitors mm -hmm. which are kind of new to star wars in this show so mm -hmm. i was excited i'm a big lightsaber fan i'm a big jedi sith fan um so i was like okay this has absolutely gripped me i wasn't sure if this was going to back when i started watching this um like in 2018 is when i think i finally got around to watching it um before i picked it up after it even ended really so yeah i was really excited that we were going to get um at least a jedi component a force component to this story because that's my favorite thing obviously not required i love andor for what it is right. but um i was excited that uh the inquisitors are new we don't know anything about them so mm -hmm. excited for what the potential of this would be mm -hmm. so we have like spark of the rebellion like the first like two-part episode and i i love just the way it begins when hera is getting to know ezra and they're getting trapped in the death star because uh, or the death star oh my god here we go. We're off to a great start. The Star Destroyer and Ezra goes back to to warn them about like maybe what's going to be happening. And Hera is saying like, uh, you know, you know, I know that who you are. She like she's not surprised. He goes back to save them. And that was like instantly. I'm like, I love Hera. Like I am all in on this tweet. Like like I am so sold. Yeah, she she's one of the most solid characters in Star Wars in my opinion, but mm -hmm. rebel bias here. Um, yeah, I love how her and Kanan complement each other. She is very grounded. Um, mm -hmm. And she can tell that 
like this kid's different. I think there's potential in him. He's unruly right now, but like, right. He's going to work for our cause. Absolutely. I freaking love when, so Kanan lets everyone, he's like, I'm going to let everyone in on the secret. The secret, and, secret. Yeah. and you have this moment where he takes his, his lightsabers like in different parts around his bells and he takes it. He's putting it together, pulls the lightsaber out as they're trying to save the Wookiees. And there's just like that moment where the force theme kind of builds up and the music, escalates and everyone's looking and all at at Kanan right now and everyone just stops shooting for a moment and that's when agent callus is just he just looks to i'm getting goosebumps right now and he's like he's like concentrate all fire on on the jedi and then Kanan starts deflecting the bolts and it was one of those where like you know this guy you know is a jedi like you know that there's some force i mean obviously you see his like plate on his shoulder right like the clone wars type like armor or whatever on his shoulder you, you see that there but it was i don't know it's just an awe-inspiring moment when you think about the timeline part of the timeline this is in how the jedi are so rare almost extinct and gone and then you have Caden stepping up to to save the day essentially yeah um that and that act putting like really the mark of death on him like the empire is now not going to let you just be like oh one of those scummy pirates trying to get some you know free some mm -hmm. wookies or like steal some supplies no that's a jedi that's like an enemy of the state mm -hmm. like that person has to die now so mm -hmm. um the act of doing that is super sacrificial for himself mm -hmm. and also it's cool that we learn later on all this stuff, but like he doesn't trust himself enough to keep his lightsaber in one piece. Like he has to separate it because he wants it to be an intentional act, putting it together to use it. And so I think mm -hmm. that's cool little part of his character that he'll have to grow out of kind of um, mm -hmm. and trust himself more. Um, and yeah, like he, I think senses that Ezra could be a good mentor or mentee. And so he's like, well, mm -hmm. I guess right now I'm going to show him that I can be a good mentor or try to be. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a really cool mm -hmm. scene and callous journey. Mm -hmm. He goes on. It's funny to see the first episode, first arc. We have these characters you know, just getting to know all of them. And it's funny to have one context as you go through the show, it changes so much. Right. And I absolutely appreciate just how they get Ezra on board. Kanan's so reluctant to train him. Like we see that through the first few episodes, like we can jump ahead a little bit, but like when they think that Luminara is still alive and, you know, they get, you know, thrust in front of the grand inquisitor there, you know, we, we learn that, you know, Kanan is not a confident Jedi. Like his, his own training was, you know, cut short and, he talks about how it wasn't that he was trying to just pawn Ezra off on Luminara if they were able to save her, which it turned out to obviously be a ruse to try to capture, you know, Jedi that had survived. But it was also, you know, a moment where Ezra stepped up and was like, I don't want the perfect teacher. I want you. And it's like, uh, not that you're not the perfect teacher. And that's when they are, their bond, I think, was really solidified and they were able to really become like a true, unique type of master and apprentice although i will say that's like episode five it's like we're like eight episodes in before they give ezra anything other than his stupid little slingshot which i'm wondering to myself how far in this show do we have to go before you can at least get him a blaster for crying out loud like he's firing off his little slingshot you know pebbles at uh blaster pebbles or whatever plasma yeah. shock rocks i don't know what it was but it's not it, if it doesn't work against stormtrooper armor all the time like it's clearly not an effective weapon no it's it's kind of funny how little they give him to work with he's just working off of like yeah a slingshot compared to like a gun um so it's <laughs> it's insane that he he's doing his best he's making it mm -hmm. with it um and that's kind of just almost like part of his character like he he's grown up on the streets as a kid his parents are gone like mm -hmm. he's had to survive his whole life with less than what you should have right in every regard so like it's it's kind of heartwarming almost it's not heartwarming mm -hmm. it's it's funny it's fitting that like he should have better but he doesn't and he's still making a way with it like mm -hmm. it, it fits absolutely what about 
the Melu run episode. Like we have to talk about that where Hera is so tired of Ezra and Zeb like not getting along. And so he sends she sends him out and she's like, Don't you dare come back here without at least one Melu run through. And she knows there are no Melu runs on Lothal. But they end up hijacking a Thai fighter in order to steal one Melu run. And like there's that scene, the moment where the the, the stormtrooper sees Ezra again as he is, you know, trying to steal the Melu run. And he's like, wait, you're doing all of this for for fruit? And he goes, no, I mean, well, I guess so. And just yeah. like there's like a chaoticness to like some of the early Rebels episodes that later on it, it get the show gets more and more intense and serious as it goes on not that there's like not still a lot of funny like moments throughout there are but as the rebellion grows like so does the the heaviness of the story and like the intense the intensity of each episode but early on there's just more of these just fun one-off episodes like this one where they you know basically cause a lot of problems with the empire over you know cantaloupe or watermelons here in you know our universe yeah exactly it's it's very funny to think about these episodes compared to, I mean, think about, we're not going to, I'm not going to dive into it, but like the way the show ends where you're getting into the world between worlds mm -hmm. and all this lore and all this heavy, heavy stuff. And mm -hmm. it's funny that you, you, the show really starts out with like, really, we're just going to go steal a cantaloupe and <laughs> that escalates into stealing a ship. And like, it's just funny antics. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's beautiful how the show can have both. It grows mm -hmm. into what it is. Um, yeah. And of, I love the episode of the Melu run, um, mm -hmm. stealing the fruit and mm -hmm. the stormtrooper realization of like, yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> they do a good job in Rebels early on of like introducing characters we've already met before too, to to steer you along your journey, but not making the journey about those characters. So it doesn't feel like whose cameo of the week is it? It's more of like, oh, we're going to meet them for a little bit, but it's still all centered around our characters. We see that with C-3PO and R2-D2 that show up early on in like episode three. We see that in the, the random Lando Idiot's Array episode where, you know, Ezra accidentally sells off, or no, Zeb, was it it's Zeb accidentally uh, sells off Chopper with Kanan's approval to to Lando, but they little they don't know that Lando, of course, is you know the biggest scoundrel they probably have ever encountered, and is going to cheat. Yeah. And so I just think it's cool how we introduce some of these characters that everyone knows to kind of not just build up our own characters, but to give them more to play with and makes the show just a little bit more fun. That sometimes be able to point at those things, especially when we're in this era of the timeline. Yeah, exactly. Lando, he's a fun character because, I don't know, as time goes on, me personally, I've just become more and more of a Lando Calrissian fan. Um, and one of those reasons is because he gets to show up in so many little more projects than just the movies. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. he shows up here. He's honestly someone who's you're rooting against. Like, you don't like the way that he's treating your new <laughs> friends, this rebel crew, this ghost crew. Um He's kind of a jerk the way he manipulates people. Oh, he is always he's always been kind of a jerk. I mean, and he cares really, about yeah. numero uno until Return of the Jedi, really, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, gosh. And there's the puffer pig scenes, too, where he's involved in that, too. Um, and they're so scared of Zeb's face and the puffer pigs, you know. It's insane. Do you have a favorite moment from season one like a favorite episode or a favorite line or any sort of like this is the this was the arc for me that that really sold me in on the show well i would say it's the the end of the season mm -hmm. um the way that ends where kanan really gets all the confidence he needs all the closure he's maybe trying to wrestle with a lot of it not all of it but um he thinks ezra is incapacitated maybe dead he's fighting the grand inquisitor and he's like you know what i have nothing left to fear and that's a bad problem for you inquisitor i am i'm not holding anything back i can now be truly balanced be truly confident in the force truly confident in myself that i'm just fighting for the light side of the force and mm -hmm. he's so much more powerful than he even realizes he is and so mm -hmm. It's a cool realization moment for Kanan. Um, 
And it's one of the reasons he's my favorite mm -hmm. character is this journey that he goes when they're on. Tra when he's trapped the after they send out the message. And I wrote this down too. It was my favorite moment of season one, or at least one of my favorite moments of season one is when Ezra falls down and Kanan says, you know, that was a big mistake. And the Inquisitor says something smart. And he goes, because you have la, 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 la. And he goes, no, because I have nothing left to fear. And he just, when he grabs the boat, and then the, the music picks up and it's like, you know and it just really elevates and it's just it's just the it's just one of those there's a few moments i just call them just like awesome jedi stuff moments like you know I, there's like no other way to put it it's just it is just an epic moment with a character that has struggled like you said with who he is being comfortable with who he is as well and he that's like a journey he's gonna go on throughout the entire show is figuring out like what is his true purpose where does he lie because as they grow in the rebellion he struggles with that and he struggles with his and ezra's place because they are attracting so much attention with inquisitors here and there so there's a lot that that happens between you know him and in his in his legacy his his mission his drive and and this one was one where he he finally came into his own in the season I, I also want to point out when they take over the communications tower in season one and Ezra sends out that message after he spent so much of the season growing in terms of his own selflessness and becoming more like his parents who were rebels in their own right, speaking out for the rights of Lethal against the Empire and were killed essentially for it. Uh, they were imprisoned and then they, you know, were killed. They died in the, in the prison as well. But Ezra speaking out and providing hope for people saying you know we have to stand together and we have to keep pushing forward and i just love the fact that his parents were able to like hear that, that he learns later on but yeah. you know it says a lot about what this show does they're able to balance something like that with kaden and with ezra having uh two very different personalities and two very different backgrounds but they make like such a such a great combination they really do um it's kind of fun to think about like the trajectory of ezra's life before the ghost crew if they had never intervened if they had never crossed paths there's right. no way ezra comes to that point mm -hmm. of like leadership of realization of like fighting against the bad mm -hmm. fighting for the greater good um, he was not on that track at all. Um, mm -hmm. And even Kanan wasn't necessarily willing to step out of his comfort zone. He was pretty comfortable in the ghost crew doing what they were doing with supply runs and stuff. But mm -hmm. putting these two together who weren't destined to be anything important or greater individually has kind of put it them together. And now it's like, they're teaching each other stuff they don't know. They're teaching each other to be better Jedi, better people, mm -hmm. um, which I'm so obsessed with. I'm so obsessed mm -hmm. with this relationship between these two. And so, yeah, it gets Ezra to the point where he's like, you know what? Like, I want better for myself and I want better for my home planet. I need to make mm -hmm. this message to Lothal. Mm -hmm. And little does he know that his parents, well, he, I do believe he knows that his parents like said the same things. Like they were, Political no, leaders knows. of like, yeah, 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 political leaders fighting against mm -hmm. oppression. So it's funny to see Let's generational go. hero heroism. I wrote a couple other just quick hitters from season one. Just give me your like rapid fire thoughts. I'm just gonna say a name or say a brief thing. You give me a rapid fire thought on that character a moment. Jai Kel, average friend. He's. <laughs> <laughs> He becomes a really good friend, actually, in the end. He saves them from some pretty bad stuff, but he's he's kind of a street rat, like what? Just street rat, like Jack yeah. catching strays today. Uh, Zebo, <laughs> um, misunderstood hero. Ooh, ooh, okay. He does have goal, like... Travis? Um, Travis, which one is that? Goal, Travis. The fake uh freedom fighter, the guy sending the messages. Uh that's to right. Lure people there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a scab. <laughs> oh my gosh, has he he deserved a worse death? He deserved okay. death. Um, this one's a little bit harder, uh, but I think you'll know what I mean. 
Callus moving at the speed of light to avoid uh, <laughs> Zeb's uh, what is it called? It's like bow rifle when they're fighting and stuff. And he does the whole like on on Twitter. There's like that one where he moves like so fast he's to get out of the way. I three thoughts or when I'm he says of... Lasat face me. <laughs> I'm kind of obsessed with the moments in Star Wars where it's like Phantom Menace, like force speed, where it's like that looked corny as H E double hockey stick. Like that looked <laughs> bad, but we left it in. The editors left it in, and I'm like, you good. Don't <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> it makes it better for me, it makes the show better that I saw that. Mm -hmm. um, last one here. Let's go with I have a few written down. I'm trying to pick which one that I want. Uh, Tarkin Town. Tarkin Town. Oh my gosh. Um, is no, which one is that? That's like so the place of... where the kids go, or like they're the refugees of Lothal are, like where when Tarkin forces them out of their like homes, and so they're going to uh, they're like out mm. in the middle of nowhere of Lothal, right? And don't they even still get? Birth bombed and burned yeah i mean eventually eventually not in eventually one. yeah still the relocation of indigenous people is heinous and Willif tarkin deserved everything that came to him mm -hmm. and then the the end of season one we are introduced to ahsoka who is fulcrum and we have you know we meet belagana earlier in the season but we are introduced to ahsoka they get to meet ezra and kanan and that was just like a really cool moment when uh you see the greatest character in star wars make her way back into live action when you hear ashley Eckstein's voice perfect way to end the season yes we both are huge ahsoka fans um so it's wonderful we got her back for the show mm -hmm. and also i'm so glad this show takes place before a new hope because that allows us to get more bail organa who is a wonderful person and a great character and i'm glad we got a little bit more of him mm -hmm. and of course you're going to introduce ahsoka tano at the end who better to also introduce on the other side of the coin than darth vader coming in to take the place of the grand inquisitor who failed and darth vader is here to make things right Yes. Um, wow. What a juxtaposition to put those two together. I mean, if you've watched everything up until that point of all of Clone Wars, they've got so much history and now you're putting them against each other. Mm -hmm. Not only does she walk away and they're kind of just at odds at the end of without Clone them. Wars. Knowing. Yeah. And so Ahsoka doesn't even really know for sure who that is. It's also a beautiful part of this show that we get is Ahsoka mm -hmm. finding out. Anakin is Vader. I mean, that's huge. Mm -hmm. And this show so gives us that. Let's, Thank let's you, jump into that. Let's jump into that. Season two is when we get Darth Vader. And ultimately, like at the beginning of the show is when they go back to Lothal of the season. Sorry, when they go back to Lothal and Vader is waiting for them on, on Lothal. And oh my goodness, when they have this whole interaction between Vader, they're talking about how much they sense the cold, the, the hate, yeah. the... You know, then that all of that with with Vader and when they drop a freaking ship on him and they're like, all right, we we're good. Let's go. And then you just see Vader just one hand like yeah. raising up the ship, throwing it to the side. And Ezra and uh, Kane are like, all right, like, let's let's get out of here. We don't stand a chance against yeah. that guy. Yeah, I like how the interaction was framed as like. I don't think we can beat him, but we need to slow him down um, so we can like all escape. And they do that. The ship drops on them. They're like, okay, finally. He lifts it up and they're like, I don't think we can even slow him down. I think we're just super screwed here. We need to just evacuate the premises immediately. So I've Kanan seen... Kanan tells Ezra like, that was a Sith Lord, Ezra. Yeah. Welcome to being a Jedi. Um, when James Earl Jones passed away, I was kind of just looking up some people's moments of like people splicing together, like top 10 Darth Vader moments. And like, oftentimes it's this scene from rebels that makes it in people's like top 10, top five ever Darth Vader moments. Like it's that powerful. Rebels gave us mm -hmm. one of the most cool scenes that Darth Vader's ever been in. So mm -hmm. thank you rebels for that. <laughs> 
So that's when we get the epic line. He's doing his piloting stuff. He's whipping through, destroying so much of the squadron. And then that's when him and Ahsoka briefly interact in this early on in the season. And we get the line from Vader when they connect. And Ahsoka's just kind of loses it. She passes out. And Vader just simply goes, The apprentice lives. The apprentice lives. Ah. Because it's it's crazy to think that, you know, they Vader wasn't. I, I have a feeling that he probably heard like rumblings possibly of her survival, but he didn't know for sure. And like, this was his confirmation that Ahsoka lives. And then Ahsoka obviously is still unsure. She doesn't know. She knows there's a connection between Vader and Anakin, but she doesn't know what that is. She doesn't know that they're one of the same. What did you, do you think, and I talk about this, do you think when Vader found out Ahsoka is there, and obviously in Twilight of the Princess, we see them go head to head. How much conflict is in Vader? Like, how much conflict is in him, even with Ahsoka? Is he, like, is he willing to even... I don't know. Like, is, is he clearly is going to kill her in Twilight of the Princess. Like, he's willing to do that. But what level of conflict is there within him? Or is it fully, like, please join me, Ahsoka. Like, please just come over to the dark side. Be on our side. Because he doesn't want to be alone. But is there is there even a moment where he... And it mentally is wavering at all. Like, what is your idea on like Vader slash Anakin at this time? Like, because I've I've heard schools of thought saying, you know, he is fully entrenched in the dark side. He's miserable and and hates himself and hates the Emperor. But at the same time, he's not like waffling ever. It's not until Luke comes around where he's finally like you know conflicted again. Yeah, this is a really deep one. Um, so I'm not going to claim to have. The best answer, the correct one, but what I see um, in Twilight of the Apprentice when they're confronted together, um, I see on screen that Vader is not waffling. I think he's very entrenched. He thinks, well, if you're not going to, you know, submit to me or anything, like I'm going to kill you, and I don't even feel bad about it. The broken mask. He's. You see a little bit of Anakin's face there. Um, he's not waffling at all. Like I think he's very entrenched in the dark side here in this episode we see, and I reference the comics too much, but like there's this journey that in the movies we obviously see in the original trilogy, it takes Luke getting through to him. There's a lot of stuff that breaks down with him from zero ABY to four ABY. I think here before a couple years before a new hope, he, he just hasn't been, confronted enough with right. reasons why he needs to change who he is. I think, mm -hmm. I think this is very monumental in him turning to the light side. I think this is maybe the first stepping stone in the long path. It took him to get to turning on the emperor. Um, he was never going to turn on Malachor, but I think this was the first thing that let him know, like, mm -hmm. well, I might, I might reconsider. I think he was never mm -hmm. going to on that planet, but that helped push him toward mm -hmm. like, there's a, there's two other Jedi here. I don't know. There's a Soka who's working with them. I think, well, you know, maybe like, I think maybe after the confrontation, after the whole world between world reset, he can like see why maybe there's like a 1% chance instead of zero. Now um, mm -hmm. it's kind of my take on it. It starts the cracks in okay. his mask starts the cracks in his belief i mean the whole interaction between the two of them on malachor is i mean that has to be that episode has to be what one of the great episodes of star wars ever made like anything it has to be up there just getting yeah. the two of their reactions to seeing each other they're actually interacting with each other and ahsoka flat out telling him like you know, there's no way you could be my master. Like, I thought I knew who you were, but my master would never do the things that you're doing. And for Vader to be like, Anakin was weak. I, I killed him in Ahsoka. Like, you know, and it's just so good. Like, I, I will avenge his death. Revenge is not the Jedi way. I am no Jedi. Like, just, oh my goodness. It just, and then when she discovers it, it's, Man, I as the as Ahsoka is like my favorite character. 
And this is not like a lot of people like I am no Jedi. This this scene is like their favorite Ahsoka scene. It's not my favorite Ahsoka scene or Ahsoka Vader scene at all. My favorite is actually in season you know one when she says this is a new day, a new beginning, and that's my favorite line from Ahsoka in in anything that she's ever ever been in. Maybe that'll change as we get more of her in Ahsoka season two and the Dave Filoni movie. Of course, her story is not completed, but that's my favorite Ahsoka line. I had actually Eckstein actually wrote that for me on the prize of my possession when Ashley signed it, my Ahsoka, you know, art. And so I have that there. I look at it every day. It's like, it's just a really good reminder. I have it written down in my school, on my board at school. It's like, it's there, it's visible. I think it's such a good reminder. But this moment here is probably, for most people, they would say maybe the best Ahsoka moments or that's the most epic Ahsoka moments. And watching her, have to deal with this because in the Ahsoka show that we get later, she's wrestling so much with the legacy of who her master is and has been holding on to that for so long. And here she's finally confronted with it. This is like the first time that we see her have to accept the fact that probably the person she cared about most in the entire world, which is Anakin, is the source of a lot of the destruction and calamity that's gone on in her life for the last several years and she's part of that legacy and guilty as well. She feels guilty about leaving him and she goes like, I won't leave you, you know, not this time. And I can't help but wonder how, like what else was going on in her mind. Like I wanted to, like, and I wish the Ahsoka show maybe had given us even a little bit more like, dialogue between Anakin and her like I hope maybe that we get some of that in season two and Hayden shows back up and and maybe we get some of that like I really want to to dive more into that relationship and and her have to have those conversations like I, I it still angers me and we haven't seen that conversation between her and Luke to talk about it like in the first time we see them is just this weird interaction amanda which is a conversation for another day but no twilight of the apprentice is forever etched in star wars lore you can actually buy if you go on her universe you can actually buy like a jacket and shirt that has the script from that episode written on uh the the clothing actually got a deal with the with Lucasfilm, with Disney, to to be able to print those on like jackets and, and t-shirts and stuff. So you can actually, if you love that episode so much, you can actually go purchase the script for it in your clothing that you can wear everywhere. That's very cool. She, the voice of Ahsoka, Ashley Eckstein, has been an incredibly big force for good of like women's clothing, just women in general, mental health in general. She's She's a treasure of a person. And so I think Star Wars is lucky to have her. Um, yeah. Thank you for going on that Ahsoka spiel. Because, I mean, I couldn't have put that together. Yeah, that, you knew what was going to happen. Yeah, of course. And I'm so glad it did because I love that character. Um, she's such a beacon of good. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it's like actually Eckstein got transported into Star Wars. Like, right. they feel like one and the same, honestly, to me. I hope that's not mm -hmm. derogatory in any way. I don't mean it like that. She is... Wonderful. Soka's wonderful. We're so lucky to have them. Also, mm -hmm. this arc, these two episodes, um, are kind of fun for people who are into the Old Republic, because Malachor is a planet deeply entrenched in that story of right. like Darth Bane and stuff. Not that I'm an expert on that story. I just think it's cool that there's some ties to Legends. If you're a Legends person, you haven't really got into canon. There's stuff you'll still like. There's stuff you have read and know that's going to be in these shows. Well, so let's and let's jump backwards in the season and talk about when Yoda, when they're in the Jedi Temple, and Ezra is talking with Yoda. Yoda sends them there, and for the reason. And a lot of people, I think, misunderstand that. They're wondering why they were sent to Malachor. And I think the lesson that we see from the weapon that is there to the the bodies that are you know petrified, frozen, dead, whatever you want to say the the massive scale battle that took place there. And Kanan says it like, I don't, I think it's Kanan. Whenever Ezra says who won, I think Kanan says, I don't think anyone did. Is it, it's Kanan or Ahsoka who says that I can't remember for sure. And yeah. I think that that was the lesson Yoda said is like, we don't necessarily, the fighting is not like the answer necessarily. Always. We were quick to rush into the battle of the clone wars, he says. And, and that didn't serve us well at all. And ultimately I think, 
what I think of when I see that is the beautiful part about Star Wars in terms of like the battle between the Jedi and the Sith is how ultimately it's decided by Luke Skywalker in Return of the Jedi when he chooses not to fight and he chooses not to attack and because he's a Jedi like his father before him and that redeems Vader and we we see the seeds of that here when Ahsoka and Vader take place and then if I want to if I may jump further on in the timeline to Rise of Skywalker say what you want about Rise of Skywalker but it's Rey refusing to strike down the Emperor and instead choosing the light and choosing to be one with the Jedi that have come before learning those lessons and using her weapons in defense instead of attack that ultimately in the Sith once and for all. And we see that right here lesson right there that Yoda himself is trying to help teach, but he also is still having to learn that lesson because an empire strikes back. He and Obi-Wan are very much like, you got to go take him out. You got to go take him out. And I think that it's just a beautiful way that Star Wars weaves this tapestry together through all these different mediums and all these different stories. And this is a prime example of that. Yeah, that's one of the hardest lessons that I think these characters learn. And I think it's incredibly powerful to grapple with is like it's not about winning the battle you're facing mm -hmm. in front of you. It's like how you choose to fight it's how you choose maybe not to fight it's what you decide to do with what you have to work with and mm -hmm. um making the morally correct decision is going to serve you in the long run always mm -hmm. like choose the high road it's not about killing your enemy it's maybe about redeeming them and that's what yoda's saying here mm -hmm. it's awesome mm -hmm. what did you think of the also on malachor Obviously, we have to talk about Maul being reintroduced into animation uh, yes. after the last time we saw him being in Clone Wars. Here he is in animation. He takes a liking to Ezra, wants Ezra to be his apprentice. He blinds Kanan. He joins them in fighting Inquisitors. He's clearly seeking the power of the temple. What did you think of Maul's reintroduction? I, I think it's just awesome. Like this, this whole two is just incredible because uh, Sam Witwer does he just delivers Maul's voice so well. Like I, I just, as much as it doesn't make sense for Maul to show up in more and more projects, it's almost like I want Maul to be in more and more projects because, because Sam Witwer is that cool. That's why I would be on board with like a Crimson Dawn Maul led animated show, animated show at some point. Exactly. Sam Witwer brings it every project he's in. He's so good at what he does. And so yeah, it, does it it doesn't make sense like why he's on that planet like we still don't really know why this would make sense in the star wars lore and i don't care <laughs> because maul is cool sam witwer is great um and there is so much stuff that alters the rest of the next two seasons that happens in this two yeah. episodes kanan is blinded for the rest of the show for the rest of his life um ezra is sent on a darker not quite. There is a little bit of him. There's talk a little about, we'll talk about seconds, Ezra. Right? Yeah. Ezra. Yeah. Ezra is sent on a darker path for mm. an arc or two of the show. He has to learn how to grapple with darkness and light for the first time, really. Um, there's just Maul existing in the in the known universe is now a problem for the Jedi at large, for mm -hmm. for you know, even the rebellion is not going to benefit from his presence. So yeah, there's just a lot of stuff going on here. It's all really cool. Mm -hmm. So right back, to, let's go back to the temple scene, back forward to the back flash, back pedal to the temple scene, whatever back flash. What's that? Flashback. Flashback. Oh my gosh. Words are so hard sometimes, but let's flash back to the temple. I love the moment where Kanan gets knighted by the Grand Inquisitor, like before he's the Grand Inquisitor, and we get a little bit of his backstory, and Kanan faces his fear again and conquers it, and he is knighted by this Jedi Temple, the, the spirit of the Force that resides in the Jedi Temple. As much as I think Ezra's arc is really cool in there, we have Ahsoka, and we'll talk about her in a moment, but I love that moment when, you know, Kanan gets knighted. Yeah, I think that does a lot for him. Um, like we said, he's been struggling with who he is, where he fits into this galaxy, his self-confidence a lot. And I think this is 
wonderful that the force itself can provide him clarity. Like, I want to use you as a tool, Kanan. Like, you you want the force to be in balance. I am the force. I want to be in balance. Like, I'm going to give you the reassurance you need so that way you can be an instrument for good. Um, mm -hmm. Is kind of how I see that. And so I love that because I, I relate. Like, I'm someone who's like, I just want to know what I'm supposed to be doing. Like... <laughs> I want to know I'm working for the greater good. Can I get some confirmation here? And Kanan gets that. I think that's wonderful. Yep. I would love, I love that every time I get that in my life. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Ahsoka as well. I, there's not a lot with her. I really want to dive into. We've talked a lot about Ahsoka, but like in the temple, she sees a little vision of Anakin. Like you don't know what I've become. She sees Vader. She's still not ready to necessarily accept that. But I want to talk real briefly. She see her and Yoda see each other before they leave. And just the happiness on both of their faces to see each other. I, I wanted to comment on that just because I love that little brief interaction where he like kind of waves and smiles and she sees him and, and smiles. And it was almost like I felt almost as if it was validation for her because she hasn't seen Yoda since she left the Jedi. And while she may still, she's probably had a lot of mixed feelings towards Yoda, but I think she holds a lot of reverence, respect, and love for him still. And to see that he was genuinely happy to see her. Like there's no love lost between the two of them. And he, he genuinely does care so much. Like I, I love that moment. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a, a good moment for Yoda really, because I've, I'm too deep on the internet. I've seen some Yoda hate before. And one thing about Yoda is he's never going to turn his back on you. Like he's so entrenched mm -hmm. in the light side. He's always going to say, he's always going to see the redemption that is possible um, right. or the lightest path forward. Like we've seen Cantum Psy or other characters in the higher public that like walk away from the order. It's happened many times and he does not give up on you. He will not refuse you mm -hmm. help ever. I love to see that extended for Ahsoka. Like, Yes, you walked away from the order and he probably understands like they're too intertwined with the politics of the Republic. He understands mm -hmm. that he wasn't leading the best order that had ever existed. So mm -hmm. I love that Ahsoka gets some confirmation from the person she probably wanted the confirmation from the most, maybe second most. Um, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. Well, I think probably the most because she knew that Anakin like had her back from the entire time yeah. like, Anakin had her yeah. back. Obviously, that she believes Anakin to be dead too, but maybe like confirmation. I think she got a little bit with Ahsoka or with the, uh, you know, at the end of Clone Wars with the Man Siege of Mandalore arc when she sees him and she knows that, you know, I think Anakin, she knows Anakin respects her decision and, and loves her and will always be a fighter for her. And he was the only one that stood by her. But to see Yoda there, I think was, it was definitely impactful uh let's go back to the beginning of the season when ahsoka sends them to find rex and we get introduced with captain rex here in rebels and the big chumba that they help get and i just love the parts where they're like t calling kanan general and he's like i was never a general oh sorry commander and they call him commander and rex like just like the good old days like when they're fighting with the jedi again and you see the jedi and the clones together and Captain Rex coming into his own with Wolf and them. So I love that part. I want to hear. I haven't. I don't think we've ever really talked about that part of Rebels before. No, probably not the two of us. Um, it's awesome that like we had Rex was a very integral part of the Clone Wars show. Um, he was, and we see that at the end. He's such a good friend of Ahsoka. That he kind of is able to stall out order 66, which is overriding mm -hmm. his like autonomy of his own brain. Right. But he's still able to hold off enough because of his love for Ahsoka, his friendship there. And so to see him use that to stave that off, but then years after he's also helped these other clones mm -hmm. through this condition. Like it's awesome to see they clearly have still a connection because Ahsoka sends that crew to go to them um and what a force well, for good who is right? it uh it's not it's not wolf is it wolf that's hiding the connection the the transmissions from ahsoka to rex right i think it's yeah. wolf who's yeah. doing that and yes, the end when rex decides to come back with them and 
a seeing Ahsoka and Rex reunited in that hug that they share is just an absolutely heartwarming scene. And sometimes we don't get a lot of those in these type of shows. We could be there's a lot of bad, there's a lot of dark moments because it's in, it's a dark time for the galaxy. Yeah, um, those two people were the closest to Anakin. I think they even they even shared. I mean, we're excluding Padme in this, I guess, and, but and Obi Wan. Yeah, and Obi Wan, but you know those four characters are like Anakin's inner circle because Rex knows that he's sending con um, messages to Padme, and Ahsoka kind of can figure that out, and he knows that she has. So it's nice that these two characters can bond over the like their shared connection, which is now becoming their own one-on-one -on -one relationship. Um, they don't need us Anakin in the room for them to be friends. Like they are friends. Mm -hmm based on their own friendship it's yeah it's we awesome. see that too at the siege of mandalore like as that goes on as uh, well yes. and what did i love hearing your thoughts about this when kanan sees the clones for the first time and he has to learn the trust of the clones after what happened to him when in bad batch we see the flashback to to when the order 66 happened and they turned on them and you know the, the uh freddie prince jr who voices kanan does such a good job there at that moment where they, they he conveys the emotion that that kanan's probably holding in for so long oh man that's that's a good moment as well yeah freddie prince jr is i love his voice as kanan um and it's it was kind of beautiful how it played out where we only get kanan's telling of how this happened mm -hmm. and then later on years later we get the show the bad batch which shows us order 66 happening to death of balaba and kanan mm -hmm. um and really like we see that kanan is telling his truth like his point of right. view on it um because really like hunter from the bad batch is wanting to help this kid like yeah all the four members are wanting to help Kanan, but it's Crosshair who is ruining this for him. And so that that one Crosshair interaction is what makes him so distrusting of the clones. Well, you know, all of them killing his master is probably what did it, but um, it didn't didn't. <laughs> that was like the, uh, it was the final straw. Yeah, the final yeah. straw. Um, I love seeing the healing that that went on here, and it took a long time mm -hmm. for him to trust Rex and these clones. He's very distrusting of them, obviously, and I think it's kind of cool to see rex telling ezra and sabine you know while he's out of the room kanan's out of the room he's like listen i get it like he's he's not wrong to distrust us like there was some bad stuff that happened but like we're good now we're fine mm -hmm. um and so just seeing that trust built up over episodes mm -hmm. long was heartwarming to see because i love kanan so much i love rex so much because of all of his time in clone wars and so I loved the journey it took to get them to be mm -hmm. friends and trusting. I think that was really rewarding to watch. So a couple of quick hitters to round out the season. Hondo Onaka, Brothers of the Broken Horn, as Hondo makes his appearance in Rebels real, and with As Morgan and Ezra. Real briefly, thoughts on Hondo in season two? I'll take as much Hondo as I can get. Um, I think he's he's so funny in Rebels. Like he. I wanted him on screen more. He's definitely a scoundrel and darker meaner in Clone Wars. He's just cracking jokes and and he's a comedic relief character, which as you go on further in Rebels, you need. So I love that he filled that position. Um, mm -hmm. He's lying and his relationship with Ezra is hilarious. How <laughs> did he just lie to me? I love that kid. Like the way that he's like, <laughs> yes, he goes, you lied to me. I knew yeah. I liked you. Exactly. Just, like, I love their relationship. Their relationship yeah. is so unique. And it's Hondo serves as like the crazy uncle slash mentor to Ezra, which I think is so, so fascinating as well. Yeah. And represents what Ezra might have been in another scenario if he went off and only cared about himself. Uh, what about Hera getting the ship, the, uh, the B wing, B -wing. To, to help break the blockade, but flying it for the first time? I will always remember her short little monologue about what it felt like to fly and be above the stars and to be in the stars and be above, you know, the ground and how she feels and how she loves flying. Gosh, that's, that's really powerful because I think that's like part of the human experience. Like you want something that is like so foundational to you that gives you such utter pure joy. 
And to have that like spelled out for you by Vanessa Marshall um, mm -hmm. in relation to flying was awesome. Um, also, like the B wings are really weird looking ships. We saw them in Return of the Jedi. Um, and to see them like be mm -hmm. the thing that almost saves the rebellion here between or before A New Hope is really cool. They're just mm -hmm. so powerful with their like four beams. They come to one, they shoot out. It's it's awesome how she has to like learn how to fly in the worst conditions. And he, I don't remember his name off the top of my head, but the Mon Calamari guy who's like, mm -hmm. if you can fly it here, you can fly it anywhere. So right. I, I love that trope, honestly. Princess Leia. Man, what a good little cameo she had. Not, I don't know if it was technical cameo, but like she was in there for one episode. Mm -hmm. She killed it. She... It's the same age as Ezra. It's kind of funny. Um, and so it's cool to see them be like, you know, Ezra, I'm glad someone like you is around because I think you could do some good for the rebellion. And for him to be like glean some stuff from her, like, you know, mm -hmm. she's going about this in a very different way than I would. And maybe I need to clean up my act a little bit. Like I think Hera <laughs> even reckless. asking Leia to maybe step in and talk to Ezra for a minute because they are closer to the same age and Leia's had to shoulder a lot and she might be able to relate with him a little bit. And then seeing Leia is always, and hearing Leia's theme is always, is always a joy. Mm. Concord Dawn. Wow. Ben I... Rao and Concord Dawn. Yeah. Something about introduction here. Ben Rao. He's the, I kind of like just saying the name. It's kind of, it's kind of just fun to say. Mm -hmm. I hope he shows up in some kind of Mandovers, maybe something that we could see later. But mm -hmm. I loved the Mandalorian lore that we got. We actually get a lot of Mandalorian canon lore from this show. So thank you, right. Rebels, for that. Um, Vizsla, Darksaber stuff that's going on there. A lot like, of it comes in like, the bulk of it comes in season three early on season four, but it yeah. starts here with that Concord Dawn stuff as we get more of Sabine and we're about to talk about Zeb a lot. And then Sabine, we're going to really talk more about Sabine here pretty soon. Yeah. So, uh, legends of Lasat when Zeb is guiding his people to the homeland. what do you think about that episode? It's also nice to see we had that Tarkin town bit earlier, which isn't like super long or anything, but like it just shows like the empire goes and displaces people all the time and wipes out nations and generations of people. And it's heartwarming to see like they didn't succeed with the Lasat people like they tried to do. Um, mm -hmm. They're able to find Lira Lasan or however mm -hmm. you say that. Um, Lira San. Lira San. Yeah. Um, and his bow rifle is actually mm -hmm. like this ancient weapon that can pilot them through the stars. Mm -hmm. Like it's cool to see that his people survived and they're thriving mm -hmm. and he gets to enjoy that at mm -hmm. the end of the show. And so that's, that's a great moment. We really get Zeb. Like this is where we really get to see who Zeb is. He's talking, he's a captain of the honor guard. They're learning about how he was a captain even of the honor guard, like Ezra's learning this. They're getting to interact with other Lasats. They thought almost all the other Lasats are dead. He, as Kate, or Zeb doesn't even want to necessarily believe in this ancient ritual, but they go and discover where their people came from. And it, it's this story of, you know, hope that persists through because his, his people are still there and there's hope for his future because you have to, imagine like you're zeb you think you might be one of the last handful of people of your entire species that exists in the entire galaxy like the weight you must feel as the last soul sur surviving lasat member has to be i can't imagine what that what that would be like you know having that weight on your shoulders and then to learn that there's actually a future for your people there is is incredible and then we juxtapose that with the episode that also takes place this season where zeb and callus get stranded on an ice planet together and callus is the one who led the assault of zeb's you know home planet and was one of the people in charge of essentially committing genocide to all of zeb's people it shows Zeb's strength of character to work with work with the person who kind of orchestrated such mm -hmm. destruction to his people, to his family. 
um, he has to work with that person. He does to survive, gets him back to his empire. He gets to go back to his ghost crew rebellion. Um, and it just shows, I mean, that's impossibly hard to do mm -hmm. to, to, to work with someone who has done so much bad to you and you still mm -hmm. have to choose to let that person help you or help them to not just off him on that ice mm -hmm. planet. Um, and the way it ends with uh, Zeb being welcomed in by his family exactly. who are super excited to see him and Callus going back to no one giving a rip about him surviving. He's in the cold darkness of the empire. He feels isolated. He feels alone. And for the first time is questioning, you know, what is his role in the galaxy? What, what is his purpose? Is he doing the right thing? I think that's like a really amazing moment. Our good friend Casey would say that's the best like episode in rebels. I think. Yes. Yes. Um, last thing here, yeah. two things. Purgle. We get our Purgle. Real quick on the Purgle. I want to talk season three. Purgle are great. Um, I like that there's this natural forming nature element to like mm -hmm. hyperspace that they get to go. So they mm -hmm. play a huge role later on. You know, and Ezra has, you know, his connections to, you yes. know, animals, which shows up really largely here for the first time. And AP5 gets recruited. <laughs> AP five. What a good little, I guess, antithesis to C-3PO, like, honestly. Um, and just a fun running mate for Chopper to interact with because mm -hmm. those two do not get along, but they eventually will. Like, it's funny to see them riff hard. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah. all right, we're into season three now. We're This is going to be a longer pod. We're celebrating Rebels. It's how often do you get to do a 10-year anniversary podcast of something in Star Wars? Not very often. So we're going to do this. It's going to go hard. Season three, we are introduced to Grand Admiral Thrawn. Thrawn makes his first appearance, his first canonical appearance, you know, since he is in these, uh, th we have a lot of Thrawn books that take place, you know, before. But here we are on screen, first canonical appearance for Grand Admiral Thrawn. This is his debut. This is where he makes his, you know, his money in our universe. We're obviously entering into a live action Thrawn era right now. Uh, but, you know, what are we, what, how do you, do you vibe with Thrawn? I know that uh, you haven't read all the Thrawn books necessarily yet, but I know that uh, you certainly have to have an opinion on Thrawn based off of being a Rebels fan. Exactly. I think, um, I think this timeline is correct. He shows up in this show and that is what sparked, well, Star Wars laid it out to where um, Timothy Zahn's books were going to come out right. after the show. So 17 through 22 is when those canonical books show up. So really this is like the first thing that is canon that Thrawn shows up in. So right. this is his introduction to canon, which is huge. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love the... Um, this, the first two seasons where you've got the Grand Inquisitor you're fighting against, you've then got um, second and fifth, sorry, seventh sister and fifth brother you're fighting against. Um, and they kind of pale in comparison to the previous Imperials you're dealing with. Thrawn, um, true to his legends, true to the, I'm sure the other books, um, he's just almost unbeatable. He is mm -hmm. so smart and calculated and he can, he can get past any kind of mm -hmm. blockade you throw up against him. So it's fun to see that almost. Uh, almost. He certainly has some battles he sacrifices in order to try to win the bigger war. Um, mm -hmm. He's a very fun, very, it, it definitely brings the show to a darker point because he is much more serious and calculated. Um, he's not a whimsical character. He's not mm -hmm. a funny character. So he brings well, up a to this point. Yeah. We've had s several Imperials that are kind of like funny characters because they're incompetent and they are terrible. But when Thrawn takes over, we get more of like the, the Imperials being a little bit more of a threat and obstacle versus the first two seasons. It's much more about like the Inquisitors and the dark side of the force. And now we get more into the manifestation of like the Imperial side of things in season three and four. And Thrawn, of course, is is the face of that. And I think he's a great uh, villain. What did you think? We have time jump here. We have a bit of a time jump. 
because Ezra now has short hair. Ezra, he's definitely much older. We're jumping forward a little bit. He's got the green lightsaber. And what do you what do you think about him? Because he's struggling with using the Sith holocron that was discovered in season two. Like I absolutely uh, thought maybe they should have gone a little further with that storyline. Like it, it only lasted like the two episodes, but you know, uh, for what it they did do with it, I thought it was it was well done. Yeah, um, I kind of, I think a, I've, as I watch people interact with the show online, I don't think many people like his new animation with his new look. I kind of liked it. He looks a little more clean kept. He looks grown up. Um, so it's a nice little reintroduction to Ezra. Mm -hmm. um, and it was nice to see, hard to see him struggle with the dark side. We've already seen you know, Anakin at this point who has the dark side ruin his life. It's hard to see someone who's such a young kid um, struggle with wanting to do bad things. He wants to do good things, but use bad power to do it. And so that's a pretty deep, tough subject to mm -hmm. gra grapple with. So it's nice to see that like, that's not the way to do things. You don't need to use the dark side to try to beat the dark side. You cannot mm -hmm. fight fire with fire. So yeah, for him to really get that is big. Mm -hmm. so we have i i am honestly i'll be one of those people i'll say it i wasn't a big fan of the look i'm not a big fan of the ezra look from season three right away like it takes me a while to get used to it like it, i honestly it's like season four i'm finally used to ezra uh looking that way i think it's just like his head it's something about the way his head looks it's like a little bit too much just i don't know it's just, i'm not a fan like it take it takes me a while to to get used to it so I do love though when Kanan has like basically been out of it and he's really struggling. He's having a hard time uh, figuring things out. But he inter he interacts with Bindu and I'm not a big Bindu fan. Like I don't think I don't like Bindu. I don't like the concept of and the idea of what Bindu represents. This is the powerful light, darkness, and he's the one that is the balance of using both. Like I don't really think that. I don't, I don't resonate with that necessarily, but I do love the part where Kanan, he, he helps Kanan find himself um, on chopper base. And he ultimately, when Hera's like going to, you know, try to save Ezra or whatever, and Kanan's already there and, and Hera's like, Kanan, you're here. He goes, Ezra needs our help. Let's go. And he's, he's like, all right, he's back. Like our guy's back. He's back, baby. That's, that's also huge as someone who, loves Kanan so much it was hard to watch that he has lost his way he's dejected um he's again back to kind of doubting himself where he mm -hmm. should be um and he's newly blind so he also can't <laughs> see much around him it just hurt to see him kind of get cut down so mm -hmm. low but boy does it feel good to get him raised back up like you know what as our news our help let's go do yes, it. i'm with absolutely. you that the bendu is not my favorite thing and i think maybe even feloni helps cement that like that's not meant to be the answer because right. the venue does not succeed or like do well in this episode or this season oh well, um, yeah when kanan does the whole calling him out like what good is what you're doing if you don't actually step up and and help the light like isn't that the point like the light should persist it's like i think people get this right. wrong idea that the balance of the force is you know both things working together no the balance of the force is the light side should be like is pursuing the light it's about finding that balance within yourself there's always going to be powerful darkness but and i think too it's like it's so much easier to to use that when it takes so much more discipline and focus to choose the right thing each and every day. Yeah. That could be its own podcast of talking about the concept and philosophy of balance in the force. But um, yeah, clearly it is not the correct thing for the Bendu to be, see this empire mm -hmm. come and want to destroy so much life. And he says, well, I shouldn't interact because like, dude, Mm -hmm. You are incorrect. You cannot stand by and watch oppression happen idly and think that you are fine. Think that you're fine. Like, it's just right. it's not okay. Mm -hmm. 
So what do you like think about the, let's talk about the mall arcs where, you know, they go to Dathomir, they recover the dark, Sabine finds the dark saber and they have the scene, the episode where there's the joining of the holocrons. And we learn like that lore. If you join us Jedi and Sith holocron together and use it, you can untap, you know, so much knowledge, but then let's, it jumps all the way to the point where Ezra and Maul are connected on Tatooine Maul lures him there to try to find Obi-Wan because he's been searching for Kenobi for so long after he found out that Kenobi's still alive from the holocrons. And now Ezra thinks that Obi-Wan Kenobi is the one that could help them save the day and defeat the Sith. But now he's worried Maul is going to kill him and we get the epic showdown between Maul and Obi-Wan one last time. Wow. And there's a lot. I love hearing um, Sam Witwer himself um, talk about this scene too because there's a lot of symbolism in it and there's a lot of um there's a lot to it that's not just the physical lightsaber duel to it um which is beautiful love that Dave Filoni gave us that um mm -hmm. the, the lore is cool where you're putting the, the holocrons together um they kind of get mixed up where Ezra gets what Maul was wanting Maul gets what Ezra was kind of wanting so it's kind of a fun little twist there um and yeah like for Obi-Wan to see what Maul has become. He's like, you are like a rat in the squalor. Mm -hmm. Like you have not, or that's maybe even what Maul tells Kenobi. Maul thinks that Kenobi has wasted his time. Here. Right. He thinks he's, he's like, wasting oh my away. Gosh. Yeah. And Obi-Wan feels sad for him. He feels pity for Kenobi. Um, th these, both of these people have had their lives really ruined, upended by Darth Sidious. So they have this connection there, but they're on opposite sides of, you know, the force here. They're on opposite sides of that conflict. And so um, to watch it play out to where really Obi-Wan has been keeping up with his training. He has been disciplined. He has been keeping at it to protect Luke. I love that it's actually displayed so well that he very quickly bests Maul. It shouldn't right. be a close fight. Mm -hmm. And it isn't. I love that. I love that there's not this drawn out, cool saber duel. It's what it mm -hmm. had to be. It's what it needed to be for the narrative purpose of what's one going character on here. has evolved into a higher state of being and evolved into something uh, beyond what he used to be versus one character has simply just stayed the same. Like you said, like Obi-Wan feels sorry for Maul that he spent his entire life trapped in this cycle of revenge and, you know, trying to be you know, grabbing power at the first sign he can. Yeah. Um, and the real world implications there are not that hard to draw. Like, mm -hmm. um, and Maul is kind of this like Sisyphus character, this like Greek story of like rolling the boulder up the hill, but right. once you get it to the top, it rolls down to the bottom. You got to do it again forever. Like that's his character. Mm -hmm. Like he's never really going to succeed. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, entertaining to watch that mm -hmm. that's how it ends mm -hmm. avengers season, he so says. season season three yeah when he says avengers obi-wan thinks that luke is the the chosen one at this yes. point and yeah. you know i i love he will avenge us in the last bit from sam whitworth there i season three is my least favorite season of rebels i'll say that uh but so like this won't take us long to talk to i don't think but we do all that arc that episode is amazing and then we have to talk about the best part of the season, in my opinion, which is the trials of the dark saber and yes. the, it's being training with the dark saber. And then ultimately we go to Mandalore and she stands up for herself and her family and has just an epic, epic moment. Tell me like, what did you think about the dark saber to me? That's just one of the peak moments of rebels. And honestly, now that we have Ahsoka and we see Sabine and Ahsoka, like this, these episodes mean even more now. Exactly. With um, the Ahsoka series that has come out now. Yeah, these hold a lot more weight knowing what's going to happen later on. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that they only strengthen what's going to happen later on. Like they're very, they're very foundational. So um, for Sabine to struggle so hard with wielding, physically just holding, wielding the saber, but also mm -hmm. struggling so hard emotionally with what has gone on in her past what she's contributed she built this weapon of great power the empire used it to wipe out so much of who she 
who she loved and her home planet um for her to be the architect of her own destruction is tough mm -hmm. and she has to grapple with that very hard for a long time her family holds it against her i mean it's it's deep stuff it's it's mm -hmm. it's incredible and oh. figuring out in herself to be comfortable to feel worthy of being even like a mandalorian she's struggling with that too and i just love like how she's when she's learning to to control the saber it, it's it's so impactful and this is the moment where we see sabine go from like just a really cool character that's part of this family and she likes to blow stuff up and and she does the funny art and she's just the cool kind of uh badass mandalorian but no like she's really well-rounded at this point she, this season does a really good job of she goes on a couple of you know side missions on her own where she extracts wedge from the imperial academy and you know we get this dark saber stuff and and she you know with Finn Rao, like they go and they you know basically uh was it is it gar saxon that she takes out and yes. and she takes out gar saxon i i love the the parts with the dark saber i i just wonder too and we'll talk about the season four like how much it felt to me and she says that she's not the one to wield the dark saber she's gonna find the one who is and she believes that's you know bo katan but there's and you know we get into that in the mando verse as well but i don't know it to me i was like when i was watching this i felt like is sabine gonna rise up and be like the leader of mandalore that's like where i felt like this was going and then it felt like we didn't do you think that's like a that was a backtrack of her character like a backpedal or do you think that was more of a oh this is a great arc and direction for sabine because maybe she's not meant to be the leader of mandalore and she's just a perfect person to to find that leader and and kind of fulfill this particular role but then get back to helping the rebellion as well great question hard to get definitive on it but i will say it did. It, it certainly felt like I was being led to think that um, she's training with this dark saber. This is a symbol of power for the Mandalorian people. If you wield this, if you have this, you are the leader of this mm -hmm. planet of warriors. So for her to train with it um, and to become proficient with it, finally after kind of an inner struggle is defeated, um, mm -hmm. I was thinking like this character has gotten a lot of development over these past couple episodes over this season. Mm -hmm. I think she would, she'd be good with, you know, wielding mm -hmm. this power for her to give it to bo -Katan, It was interesting. I mm -hmm. and well, especially because you have people like Finn Rao and others that are saying like, they're watching what she's doing and they're saying like, I would, I would follow her. Like I would yeah. follow Sabine. Yeah. She is gaining the trust of fellow Mandalorian. She's gaining the trust of the ghost crew. And so I thought she was going to be a good leader for Mandalore. Um, maybe Doesn't a reluctant And even in season four, say something along the lines of like, you're a leader. Like I could see myself following you. Like Bogatan teaches her some lessons, but I almost feel like Bogatan also uh, with Finn Rouse thinking about like this, she could be the, a leader that we need right now. But yeah, I don't think Bogatan showed signs that she was power hungry, that she was like, wanting it all along i think she gladly accepts the dark saber um she she's seems to be comfortable in a power of position of power um so i think she has no problems taking it i think she even would have gladly taken a pretty powerful position in sabine's mandalore um but is anyone really i don't know has the the night of tears happens or whatever you call that the night of a thousand tears night of a thousand mm -hmm. tears um was sabine going to be able to stop that from happening i don't know it's, it's not, it, yeah. like it was you know if you ask mandalore maybe it was cursed because bo yeah. didn't earn the dark saber so we have a couple of quick hitters here mon mothma gets introduced and after the Gorman massacre, that was just mentioned a little bit in Andor, as they'll see, they talk about the Gormans. Uh, did you enjoy the brief Mon Mothma that we get and, you know, some of the new scenes that she's in in Rebels? Um, kind of huge for the rebellion, honestly. Like, it's huge for Star Wars, the entire story of it. Mm -hmm. She is in this. She This is where she publicly denounces the Empire, the Emperor. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, it's awesome that we get her. We get her sparring 
politically with um, Forrest Whitaker's character. Saw Guerrera. Saw Guerrera. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's cool that we get her. She finally is a mm -hmm. leader for this alliance that they've needed so and, bad. And it's growing. Like we're watching the rebellion grow yeah. from these cells. It's starting to come together to form like a larger, you know, group. Uh, what about the Calicori? We get to see, we go to we go to uh, Hera's home planet of Ryloth, and mm. we get to have like see Thrawn now as the one that has this under siege and is in charge of operations here. But we learn a little bit about you know the culture of the Twi'leks, which I thought was really fun as well. Yes, so I'll always take more Ryloth content. Um, it I think it says a lot that she's willing to risk so much to get this Calicori back, which is a family heirloom. Um, and it's fun that this is a piece of art for her that means a lot to her. Theron mm -hmm. is studying this piece of art. That's his thing. That's how he figures out how to beat mm -hmm. people. Um, so I liked that family is put that high mm -hmm. on the pedestal for Hera and essentially for her found family to fight for her biological family's heirloom. Right. That's amazing. I mean, you can't ask for more love than that. I mean, that's just, mm -hmm. you can't ask for more. It's wonderful. We have ghost, ghost of Geonosis with Saw and Rex, and they're reunited, you know, for the first time in quite some time. And we're starting to see the aggression and over aggressive nature of Saw Guerrero that's going to force him to, in his eyes, splinter away from the main rebellion. And we see the drawing of like the Death Star, you know, by what they call them, clack clack, click, clack. or whatever, click clack or whatever yeah. is what they call the the last surviving Geonosian. And this is like our first example of on our screens of seeing complete, you know, genocide by the empire. Yeah. Which once you realize this is what's happened, that like, where is everyone? Why is, why are there no like native population? It's heavy. It's hard that like the empire wiped these people out. Um, I was wanting Saul Guerrero to like succeed so bad. He's trying to trice down like, what happened here? Why is this huge crystal being transported somewhere in the middle of dead space? Like I was rooting for him so bad, to, like figure this out and like stop a new hope from happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, figure it out. Well, he, that, that episode two of the crystal that takes place in season four and right. but season three, like, this where he, he is convinced yeah. that, but he's convinced though, that there's something going on that they're missing. And it's like, he's not going to figure it out until like a couple hours before that very thing blows him away. So it's, it's, it's pretty, uh, it is pretty crazy how his whole story, you know, comes to an end, but it is remarkable. Like what uh, we're seeing here, like what the empire is capable of. And they're not like pulling punches. They're basically showing you that the empire wiped out an entire uh, group of people and how important it was to stand up to them. And then, they, you know, of course it ends with chopper base under siege. It looks like all is lost, but uh, you know, due to Imperial incompetence by Admiral Constantine, with then Ezra punching through the blockade, bringing back some Mandalorian help in Sabine, who was with her family, her family comes and they help them out and they're able to, to get away and escape. Uh, it's a good solid ending to the season, which sets up an amazing season four, shorter season from the previous two, but let's go ahead. Let's, let's dive into, into this one. You know, saw us closing in on the death star. We start off though with the heroes of Mandalore. Sabine, I think comes into her own here. We see her, like you said before, having to own up to the weapon that is now operational again, and it's targeting Mandalorians. Of course, it targets the Beskar and wipes out uh, so many of her people. She ultimately has to answer for that, and we see just some very raw, like emotional moments with Sabine's character as she has to ultimately make the decision to uh, to turn the weapon off relinquish it not use it to use more destruction on the empire but also she has to accept uh, like what she did and confront her very people about it too while also convincing them that they need to follow her into battle here yeah she's she's faced with like an impossible situation here of trying to stop massive destruction trying to also stop this weapon from being used ever again um which is honestly a tough decision i mean she's being pushed by multiple friends um that, yeah we can just take this back and we can use it against the empire if they 
if they have something like, I mean, obviously the Death Star hasn't mm-hmm. happened yet, but if they're going to have some weapon of mass destruction, shouldn't right. we have one too? Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of harkens back to the viewer watching Yoda say like, you know, it's not about like the, the power to destroy. It's it's about redeeming. It's about taking mm-hmm. away that destructive power. So another right. theme that is just overarching through this show is like taking mm-hmm. away the mass destruction element of war. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, as Mandalore plays on, Sabine then is like, I'm going to go and, you know, I have to be, I'm going to help my, you know, I've helped my family here and now I have to help my other family out and they're going to go to the fall and they're going to try to liberate Ezra's planets. Finally, we're going to see them try to liberate Ezra's planets. And I think it's just wonderful how all of the characters get together here. It's like this big, you know, coming coming in party where you have Vizago that they they have, like, have to go and they save Vizago from like a mining operation. This guy that they've been, you know, doing weapons exchanges with and things like that. You have Hondo and Melchi coming in. Rex is here. You know, Ryder Azadi is like leading this campment and everyone's going to ultimately get together in the finale. But the journey to get to the point where that finale happens on the Thal from seeing Thrawn's TIE Defender project to the Loth Wolves and with the Loth Wolves are, you know, impacting Kanan's journey. Let's, let's go ahead and I don't want to like, not that we're skipping over season four, but like, let's go ahead and talk about like those last four episodes, like where it really like ramps up and Hera is captured when she is trying to break the blockade to bring reinforcements, bring supplies to them on Lothal. She's captured and Kanan's like, we're going to go and we're going to go save Hera. Like, and we're going to, we also have to stop, you know, the empire in when we do this. And Kanan not only gets the Calicori <laughs> and saving the girl, he saves Hera. They're making their way out. And ultimately the empire decides that, you know, governor price decides they're going to blow up their own refinery to stop these rebels. And the explosion happens. And, you know, obviously if you're, listening to this you, you've watched rebels but that moment when he's stopping the fire one hand going one way and then the other way he's pushing them to get them away he's got both hands and he pushes them on and the force just gives him his sight back so he can see Hera one last time that is it does not matter that you know that Kanan's going to die from the very first time you see him in this show because it's obvious that that is how his arc is going to end. It does not matter whether or not you are a Kanan fan or Rebels fan or not. Like that scene, you know it's what's happening. You know it's going to happen that season. You know that there's going to be this epic sacrifice by this by this hero. It just absolutely delivers every time. And every time I I get emotional. Every time I think to myself, like this is this is peak, like this is Star Wars, like this is this is why Star Wars is is worth watching. When you watch like someone sacrifice themselves in such a way, it's very powerful. Um, a little piece that I like to point out before it even gets to this point is the fact that they decide they're going to well, they get told that basically if they go back to Lothal to try to even go back to that planet, they're on their own. The rebellion cannot yeah. support them going back there. Mm-hmm. That's a part of it that it's hard to grapple with. We then mm-hmm. get to the point where they're trying to save Hera. He, Kanan, knows that he is too close to her to make a good decision on being the lead for this mission. He asks Ezra to lead it. Mm-hmm. And I just think that's so selfless. Like that's, you just don't see that. That's such a good example for people like, I'm too close to the situation. I'm going to make a mistake. I know myself that well. Mm-hmm. I'm that balanced that I don't have to be the lead. This job needs done. I don't need to be the one to lead it. It's so selfless. I love that about Kanan. And it hurts so bad to see this character who is so good, so balanced, to see him sacrifice himself. And I mean, mm-hmm. he has to for the Empire to fall, ultimately. Like, mm-hmm. he he sacrifices it all for the greater Mm -hmm. good, for his love of each one of those characters. Um, Never fails to make me cry watching that, especially if I've watched, you know, like if I'm doing a show rewatch, a series rewatch. Oh yeah. If I get to season four, episode 11 or 12 Jedi Knight, um, I'm crying. 
10? I'm crying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. I think, I don't know for sure, but I think it's 10. So I think he knew that was going to happen too. Like as they're, as they're going, I think when he talks with like the wolves and he's learning and he's meditating, like he cuts his hair the way it was short the first time, like they met each other. Like, I, I feel like he, he, he knew something, whether it was the wolves giving him like some sort of vision or his conversation with them or something from the force. Like, I think he knew that when they went out that evening, he had to put Ezra in charge because of what you said, but also because he knew he has to step up. We need other people to step up. I can't be the leader anymore because this is, I'm going out to, to do this one job. I'm going to save her. I'm going to save this group. And it's going to be my last mission. I would agree. I think the force is, I mean, the wolves, these loath wolves, um, like are the force itself incarnate almost. So it's kind of a weird mystical thing going on there. So mm -hmm. I don't doubt, I, I fully do believe that like the force is working through these wolves to tell Cain and like, you are going to make the ultimate sacrifice here, but it, mm -hmm. it will be worth it. You can go ahead with this knowing that things are going to maybe work out. Like maybe he has this premonition of even beyond what did we see in the show of rebels? Like he knows that like this rebellion that he's been a part of begrudgingly at first is going to succeed. The force is going to be in balance. Like it's going to take your sacrifice to make this happen. I think he, maybe he's just, at peace with I that. I just string together like five images that are, that just scream start like emotional, like star Wars carnage for me. Like, or like that's one of the like five images like that one. I, I go to, the image in last jedi where ray's lifting all the rocks and there's like scene with all the rocks like that's like the the opposite side of emotional like obviously i'm like inspired in that one so like i go to that one or maybe like when uh pedro pascal and like din Djarin's taking off his helmet to look at groku for the first time like on that one i go there uh, i think about you know in uh empire strikes back maybe it's han and leia like looking at each other before he goes or in return of the jedi when luke's looking at his father you know for the first time like th these moments these images like that and Kanan, i think stands right there with the rest of them for me like in terms of what i absolutely it just it just hits you in the chest every time absolutely it's it stands up there this animated show stands up there this moment like with some movies theatrical mm -hmm. releases it's crazy that it does mm -hmm. so what do we think about the world between worlds introduced here with this whole architect thing and uh what do we think about the world between worlds i thought it was you know i like this world of like this idea of like getting really mystical and like mm -hmm. the weird spots of fantasy it's really really fantastical um I don't like when I see this concept being played with by fans like, well, let's undo this timeline. Let's use this mm. to do something else stupid, for lack of better right. terms. I thought it was a really nice, it was really fun to do, uh, to use for this show. Also to let Ezra grapple with Kanan's death even more. Like you cannot pull him out of that because you don't survive that. Like mm -hmm. there's all these things that he gets to learn of, or learn about because of, uh, this little lore of world between worlds. And we're, so. we're hearing voices of Ray, of Kylo, you know, Obi-Wan. He pulls Ahsoka out and we get him and Ahsoka reunited. And we see the dangers of what could happen if Palpatine were to have like access to this as well. And then you throw in the Mortis gods being their uh, entrance and entrance and pathway into the world between worlds at this particular portal i guess for it it's it's so much lore it's just like the this is like the weird part of star wars like the weird lore aspects that uh, i i love because you can have goofy melu run, run like fights and sequences and you can also have something like this going on where it's this intense mystical force lore while you can also have a show like andor that's very grounded and gritty that is like on the front lines yeah i think that's the beauty of star wars as a franchise is that you can get anything you're looking for um part of this like final arc that's really interesting to me is sabine having to kind of be a prisoner and like work with the main excavation mm -hmm. lead guy who's trying to get some force artifacts for palpatine um that's, yeah, that's good point. they're both working together to try to figure out this like portal to the world between worlds um and it's just interesting the dynamic how he wants this information she yep. 
doesn't need it, but is kind of forced to help him out with it because she's so smart with symbolism and everything. It's a testament to like her knowledge of like how smart mm -hmm. she is. She's known as like the Mandalorian blowing stuff up person, but she's absolutely got the intellect to the art to artistic side and yeah, you know, the artistic side of her mm -hmm. and everything. So now even moving forward, we get to like the final the finale, you know, where they come together to to ultimately defeat Thrawn, who is uh, they're trying to liberate Lethal once and for all. And Ezra has this whole plan. And he has, like, he knows this, like, vision of what he needs to do. And he knows what's going to happen. They take control of the station. And he basically sacrifices himself. What do you think of Ezra's, like, sacrifice with the Purgle, bringing the Purgle in to launch himself? And now we know into another galaxy. Yeah, it's kind of funny how this question was unanswered for six seven years um what happened to him where is ezra um his sacrifice there it's it's so light side like i'm not going to kill thrawn i'm not going to destroy his men or anything like that mm -hmm. i'm going to remove him from the the situation from the galaxy i'm going to keep him alive like it's protecting life even for people who you might decide don't deserve to live it's not my decision. I didn't create your life. I'm not going to take it. It's the light side decision to do to like, I'm just going to remove you from doing further harm. And I think that mm -hmm. that is almost impossible for our human brains to comprehend, but he does it. I mean, it's so noble and he has to sacrifice his friends. He doesn't get to see them anymore for at least mm -hmm. 10 canonical years. So mm -hmm. it's wonderful. It's mm -hmm. hard. And Ezra just rejecting Palpatine's offer, rejecting, you know, too. the idea of his parents being back and, and eliminating Palpatine's ability to have access to the world between worlds, essentially at that point is massive because a Palpatine that has access to the world between worlds could rule in, you know, forever at that point. And yeah. Thrawn, it's funny how Thrawn gets bested by the one, you know, he there's one thing he cannot control. There's one variable, and that's this, you know, this the force and the will of the force and the power of the Jedi to to wield it. And that's like the one variable he can't account for. And I can't wait to see like how he tries to account for that uh in you know Ahsoka season two. And so like Ezra making that sacrifice and then is just a wonderful, it's a wonderful way for his arc to end at that point. It, it's because he's going from like the street rat Aladdin kid in season one to willing to, to do the ultimate sacrifice for his, his friends and, and displaying his power with the force too, like where he's come from. But, and I love Hera is like the mom who's just there wanting to protect her kids and keep all her kids together. And she's lost Kanan. Now she loses Ezra. Like for me, like she's the one, Oh my goodness, what she goes through. And then Sabine and Ezra having this, uh, tight bond having essentially grown up together in a lot of respects during these last several years together and then we get to the the epilogue afterwards you know which we see in ahsoka like happen a little differently in ahsoka but still there and uh, knowing that this journey is going to continue in, in live action now and i absolutely just am am so excited to see what happens in the future i i love how you know we have this story in Rebels that's now getting, you know, continued on to some degree. I still wonder if I kind of wish sometimes like we had this an animated version of this, but I love the fact that, you know, we're going to continue this on on like a grand level because I, I love the fact that these characters get to live on this in this big uh, epic universe that we have. And, you know, season four is great. If you had to rank the Ghost Crew in terms of like your favorite character to like least favorite character of the Ghost Crew, what would you... What would you do? Or we want to, you don't want to do that. I understand you don't want to do that. No, I mean, we can totally do that. Um, I just understanding don't want to... that you love all of the ghost crew. Exactly. I don't want it to be misconstrued that if I rank someone as last, that I don't like them. I absolutely love every character in this ghost crew so much. Um, Kanan is going to go my top spot. I will go Hera, then Ezra. Um, then I'm going to go Sabine, then Zeb, then Chopper, I think is where I'm going to. We didn't even go. really talk about Chopper, but we talked about this for two hours. We didn't even talk about Chopper. That's like a disservice <laughs> to droids. Although I, I, so I, I'll bring up a Chopper moment then. 
when he gets like taken over by the imperial guy who's mm. like using him and Hera's like so upset she's like i know my droid he fixes him sends the back loop he's like hey Slimo, find your own droid to you know cherry pig or whatever next time and then just blows them up how many people do you think chopper kills in in rebels like how many lives I've, taken by chopper yeah he actually kills quite a few people if you like if you want to look it up the internet has the answer out there for you it's like fifty thousand people if you like <laughs> count up i don't know how they get that number but i've seen that before where it's like he kills like thousands of people if you count up all these things so or when the yeah. the droid is sitting up there they have this like new droid that they took from the imperials and they're like oh he's he's so nice he's helpful and shopper literally just Boom. knocks him <laughs> off the off the ship takes him yeah. out fantastic he's a fiery fantastic. little little addition to the ghost crew i love him i'd go uh hera one uh kanan sabine and then i would probably go zeb ezra chopper Probably that's fair do. yeah i mean that's that's good but as we're uh, ranking so, in a little low for you but i just i'm not fair. like the biggest fan of ezra like personally, like I love every, like I said, the rebels is a great show. I love, I love these characters. So I'm not going to say like, I don't like, it's not like I don't like Ezra or anything, exactly. uh, but yeah. in terms of like, I just love the fact that so Hera to me is just probably one of my five, six favorite characters in star Wars, like uh television. And then Kanan is just epic and what a Jedi should be. And then oh. Sabine, if you ask me this question, first two seasons, it's, she's probably like the last one on the list, but I love I really respect, I really adore the arc that she has in three and four and the character Ooh, that she's yes. becoming uh, at the end of the show. Is So I, I really love that. And Zeb, I don't think Zeb gets enough credit as a character for what he does. He brings in Agent Callus into the Rebellion yeah. and is able to become good friends and close allies with someone who is responsible for killing his most of his people like was one of those people that made was in the decision room and uh was leading that charge and to have the humility and the forgiveness inside of you to to put the rebellion's needs over your own to forgive someone for such an atrocious act like i don't know if i could do that like if i don't i don't know if i would be able to do that and zeb does that and he he keeps that hope alive and his people for his people and he carries the torch for them in so many ways. And I just think that Zeb doesn't get enough credit. I, I'm so excited to see him in live action uh, a little bit more. We saw him at the very end of Mando season three, but we know that he's going to be in the Mando and Grogu movie, which is really exciting. And so I can't wait to do this in 10 years when we are on the rebels uh, portion of the timeline show. I absolutely cannot wait to break down each and every episode with you, sir. Oh, that's going to be a fun time because we'll get in the nitty gritty and we'll talk about stupid stuff with melee runs and whatnot. Yeah, it's going to be a fun time to actually go through each episode and and break it down almost too far. But yeah, <laughs> this show has a very big spot in my heart because of all these characters and how good they are, how good the relationships with them are. Mm -hmm. So follow me on Appetite Bread 5. You can follow Luke at Luke Sheehan 5 on Twitter as well. Follow us on Star Wars Newsnet for all of your Star Wars news and updates. We will see you Thursday at 10 o'clock Eastern time for the live show. Check out the timeline show as well for Light and Life, everyone. Remember, we are all the Republic.